Hello, my name is Ara Keshishan, and I'd like to talk about surgical re treatment of GERD, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. We'll start briefly talking about the anatomy. Um, anatomical causes of reflux are um, hiatal hernia, failure of the lower esophageal sphincter, and motility disorder. If you think of the RGI tract being a log, conduit that starts uh, uh, at the esophagus all the way to the distal colon, uh, it's supposed to push the food down in a certain uh, way, in a certain um, uh, speed, and there are certain um, anatomical pressure points that are preventing the food to come back. One of the more obvious ones that we've all heard about is a pyloric valve, which theoretically is supposed to prevent reflux of the uh, content from the small bowel to the stomach. There is a uh, physiologic uh, valve or a sphincter at the distal end of the esophagus, the connection between the esophagus and the stomach, and if that fails, then you have reflux of the food content or the acid from the stomach back into the esophagus. A hiatal hernia, which is the opening uh, through which the esophagus goes through, if that's stretched or there's some ana anatomical changes to it, and that'll result the content of the stomach to go uh, back up the esophagus. Uh, physiologic cause of the reflux disease may be increased intra-abdominal pressure, and this is in context of obesity. A patient may have um, no evidence of hiatal hernia and have normal esophageal sphincter function and have no motility disorder of the esophagus. However, as increased abdominal pressure may result, it can push the food down um, up the uh, esophagus from the stomach. Um, further uh, uh, specific discussion about weight loss surgery and reflux disease takes us to the um, high pressure, low volume env environment of the sleeve gastrectomy. And as um, whether this is the duodenal switch or the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy operation, there is a fine a line between making the sleeve too tight uh, for the benefit of few pounds of excess weight loss and the trade-off being creating a, such a high pressure environment that that pressure overcomes the uh, lower esophageal sphincter pressure and patients have continuous reflux. Um, definition of the reflux starts by, it's uh, as the name states, reflux to the esophagus of the content of the stomach, um, whether it be what we've uh, digest, uh, where we in ingested in the form of meals, uh, or whether the secretions of the stomach itself. Um, there could be short or long-term consequences. Uh, the more obvious uh, short-term uh, immediate symptom may be the burning, the, the sort of uh, the nausea or the reflux symptom of it. Long-term may be things like motility disorder, persistent irritation of the esophagus may cause scarring of the esophagus, which shortens the length of the esophagus, and cellular changes that may result in what we call the bare changes. Um, the sort of medical treatment uh, of reflux disease has been uh, sort of uh, simplified to, well, if something causes reflux, then avoid that particular food. Over-the-counter medication have been aggressively marketed. There's a, a number of home remedies, uh, you know, um, such as apple cider vinegar, uh, you know, baking soda, etc. Then the famous uh, purple pill that's advertised on TV and billboards everywhere that's supposed to be a cure-all. And um, it is very important to appreciate that um, clearly with the, if, if food avoidance of a certain type will eliminate the reflux, then that's great. But other than that, all of the other remedies that are available out there, all they're doing is they're masking the symptoms of the reflux and they're not eliminating the reflux. Um, medications to stop the GERD, the patient's reflux remains the same with the medication um, and there is a perceptive difference in the appreciation of the reflux but not the actual reflux itself. So. The treatment are also only or nearly. They do not resolve or stop the GERD. They only minimize the symptom or the perception of the GERD. Um, 
There are different class of medication, the proton pump inhibitors, the PPIs, the H2 blockers, the histamine blockers, antacid, bile resins, and they all uh, work in different uh, physiologic pathways of the acid production, or they're supposed to, uh, you know, nullify the acidity or, 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 you know, normalize the pH or the acidity of the GI content. And uh, they work by reducing the amount of the acid only in a temporary fashion. And the patients, ref the treatment uh, options for gastroesophageal reflux disease are, uh, we can talk about the medications, there are a number of class of medications, the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers or histamine blockers, antacid and bile resins. Uh, all of these work by uh, different, uh, by affecting the different pathways and mechanism of the uh, acid reflux, whether the excess acid production, low um, antacid presence in the GI tract and or bile reflux. And it's important that we all appreciate all of those medications. They neutralize the chemical environment of the stomach, and yet they do not prevent or reduce the reflux. So a patient that may have reflux symptoms other than the obvious nausea and uh, burning, uh, and those may be symptoms such as a silent asthma, recurrent pneumonias, they will continue to have those symptoms all, uh, after the treatment, medical treatment uh, of reflux because the acid reflux continues in the absence of the perceptive components of it. The proton pump inhibitors is what we're going to talk about for the uh, for next one or two slides. They're the most commonly prescribed medication for acid reflux. Mechanism of action is to reduce the acid secretions of the gastrin cells and it's important to appreciate that it does not have any effect on the bile or pancreatic enzyme or pepsin. So in patients, for example, that have bile reflux gastritis, proton pump inhibitors will have no uh, effect. The issue with the PPIs is that uh, it's, so it, it was meant uh, and continues to be, uh, at least from the FDA's perspective, a temporary treatment and it only masks the symptoms. Uh, and when the treatment stops, the rebound will be worse. Um, the PPIs do not treat the, the, the issue with the lower esophageal sphincter valve dysfunction, whether it's actual because of hiatal hernia, shortening of the esophagus, and or it's a pressure, inherent uh, pressure issue with the LES. And um, the PPIs also uh, may inhibit the biofeedback of the gastrin cells. And in fact, when uh, the, the PPIs are stopped, the rebound gastric acid secretion is significantly increased. Chronic gastric reflu uh, acid reflux results in fern complications, as we briefly talked about, such as uh, you know, recurrent uh, pneumonias, asthma, um, in an adult that may have no other risks, in addition to anatomical issues such as ulcerations, stricture, shortening of the esophagus, and eventually Barrett's esophagus. I'm sure uh, most of us have either been on or know someone that is on these medication, the sort of purple pill and the protonics, and um, uh, th those uh, inserts uh, next to each one of them or below them are, uh, are copy and paste of their own material that's on the website. So as far as Prilosec is concerned, use as directed for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn. Do not take for more than 14 days or more than every four months unless directed by a doctor. It's sort of interesting that the FDA's release and the manufacturer's own website says don't take it more than 14 days unless a doctor tells you. And again, there's no scientific evidence that this should be taken for a long period of time. And all, we all know that in fact, there are consequences to patients being on PPIs long-term with regards to vitamin D, um, you know, bone issues and so forth. When it comes to protonics, Again, same thing that says that this has not been approved in certain ages and the treatment is only for uh, eight weeks long and, uh, you know, should only take it uh, under supervision of a physician, uh, which again, we're, we're asked to prescribe this without really much scientific evidence to back it up long term other than patients have taken it for long term and that's sort of been the evidence for it. Gastroesophageal reflux disease may have long term consequences. Uh, these include ulcers, 
adult onset asthma, recurrent pneumonia, esophageal uh, dysmotility, and Baird's esophagus. Um, a patient that may have symptoms of reflux and the symptoms are masked with PPIs continues, as we've discussed earlier, continues to have the chemical reflux, except because of the acidity and the pH of it has been neutralized, um, it is not causing the symptoms that a patient may perceive, yet these things continue to occur. And a patient, for example, may find themselves laying down uh, with, uh, you know, after meals, few hours after meals, or taking their routine, uh, you know, PPIs or antacids, and they find themselves usually waking up in the morning with coughing spells, or they have episodes of asthma, and yet they have no risk factor for asthma. So if a if if an adult who's non-smoker who's never have and who's never had asthma and who has no other risk factors such as you know environmental work-related exposure, um, one has to consider that uh, a, a, an adult onset asthma uh, should be uh, worked up for a silent reflux um, till proven otherwise. Uh, Baird's esophagus. Baird's esophagus is a condition that may occur after uh, long-term gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, by definition, it's an abnormal replacement of the normal uh, lining of the esophagus with the abnormal lining, um, and normally it's uh, sort of squamous epithelial um, and uh, may be converted to uh, columnar epithelium with goblet cells. Um, this means that the chronic damage to the esophageal lining no longer allows for the proper and normal healing, and this results in irreplaceable, irreversible replacement of healthy cells. Um, th th this can lead to adenocarcinoma or a type of cancer of the GE junction, which has an 85% mortality rate. It is uh, imperative that we all appreciate that Baird's esophagus is completely preventable with the proper treatment of the GERD, not masking it with PPIs. Um, what restores the barrier to reflux? Minimal invasive surgery, uh, the laparoscopic nissen fund duplication, endoscopic treatment. There's a number of uh, uh, endoscopic, meaning uh, through mouth by upper endoscopy treatment that have been advocated throughout our endostitch enteric esophics. And there's also a laparoscopic procedure, which is a sort of a magnetic ring that's placed uh, instead of the wrap, which is, uh, you know, the Lynx uh, sphincter, uh, uh, which has been advocated. There's some recent data that just came out that's five years out that shows promising, given that it's very interesting that the data that's published is relatively small, 100 and some odd patients. So uh, I think the, the jury is still out on that. When it comes to diagnosing the... Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, the, the, the sort of gold standard is based on what we, uh, what's known as the Meester's uh, scale. And uh, for this to uh, be done, a, um, a sensor, a small uh, sensor is placed for a 24-hour period uh, connected to a small wire to the patient's nose, and this sensor is placed 5 centimeter above the lower esophageal sphincter. And a patient essentially walks around with a halter monitor, taking notes all of the activities that are happening. Um, and the sensor essentially measures the amount of reflux from the baseline. And so a uh, patient is supposed to keep a record of it. And as you can see on the right side of this example, for example, there is uh, sort of uh, markings of the belching and the coughs and the nausea that the patient records, uh, uh, keeps the records of. And what that allows the, the, the physician who's analyzing this to look at it is to compare the presence or absence of any reflux as measured by changing the acidity to the symptoms that the patient was having. And this is essentially analyzed and a score is given and the score uh, describes the severity of the patient's um, uh, reflux based on the Demister score, and then that becomes essentially a, 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 a diagnostic tool to recommend um, the, an intervention, I, you know, theoretically surgery. Minimal invasive surgery, laparoscopic nissen fund application is the um, surgical procedure that's recommended. 
uh, there's three to five small incisions are made less than one inch and there's no uh, foreign object placed other than the sutures that are used it's one to two hour procedure um, some uh, places will patient will be uh, kept overnight and patients are able to return back to work in about one to two weeks after surgery. Um, it's 90% effective in re restoring the barrier to the reflux. So this not only um, takes away the perception and the percep perception of the reflux, but also prevents from any content of the stomach inappropriately refluxing back to the esophagus. Clearly this is a uh, it's a two-way street. Some patients may have some difficulty with belching uh, and being able to burp or in extreme cases throw up and in some extreme cases patients have difficulty swallowing that over time relaxes and some patients may actually have to have further require uh, further treatment be endoscopy or balloon dilatation. But the point to be made is that the, 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 the definitive treatment is not to mask the symptoms but recreate that high pressure environment between the junction of the esophagus and the stomach to prevent from the content of the stomach to go back into the esophagus. Um, patients are able to stop all of the heart, uh, the, the heart burn medication for the most part and decrease the chance of developing Barrett's esophagus and cancer because again, you're correcting the underlying problem. Um, unlike medication, laparoscopic nissen medication treats the problem, not the symptoms. Uh, the demister fondoplasty, uh, the, the, the nissen fondoplication, is as you can see the image on the left, the esophagus is sort of the um, lines coming down and the um, wrap of the stomach is made uh, to create a sleeve, um, uh, sort of a washer type environment to prevent from the acid uh, going up. This animation sort of provides it a little better where the fundus of the stomach is made, it's pulled on the back side of it and allows for it to wrap and you create a, a washer, you sort of with the stomach itself being used as a washer, it creates a tightening, anatomical tightening right at the GE junction to prevent from the content of the stomach to go back. On one of our earlier slides, we talked about one of the causes. As we talked on uh, in uh, one of our earlier slides, hiatal hernia may be a cause of the reflux. On the left uh, side of the slide, you can see what's described as normal anatomy, and you can appreciate that uh, that the lighter color gray line represents the diaphragm and the white uh, tube below that is the part of the esophagus about two centimeters or so that's supposed to be below the diaphragm before it connects to the stomach. In a sliding uh, type hiatal hernia you lose that part of the esophagus being in the abdominal cavity and in fact the esophagus may be pulled up so you have part of the stomach pulled up into the chest cavity and because of the breathing cycle and loss of that low uh, the uh, lower esophageal sphincters functionality you have part of the stomach that, that now sits in the chest and that can cause uh, for the uh, content of the stomach secretions or the food to slide up by, by uh, up to the esophagus over a prolonged period of time with that sliding component, you may actually lose the anatomical contours of the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, the, the, there's a, uh, another type of hiatal hernia, which is uh, known as paraesophageal hernia, in which case you may or may not lose some of the contour of the junction between the esophagus and the stomach, but you have the fundus of the stomach, the greater part of the stomach, sort of on, a, on its own slides above the uh, diaphragm and sits in the chest cavity. Uh, the downside or complications of the Nissen is that it is a technically uh, complicated surgery, greater than 90% success rate in surgical practices that have experience and volume of operation enough uh, with Nissen uh, or uh, for gut surgery. Um, the side effects of it may be uh, difficulty with uh, belching. Um, some patients may have early difficulty and limited that uh, time res uh, with time it resolves with uh, in certain types of meals or food usually dry meals and you know the dry piece of barbecue chicken versus uh, you know a softer fish or uh, uh, things like that gas bloating 85 percent at one year that's self-limiting and as i said difficulty with belching or vomiting and difficulty swallowing short term that all gets resolved um i would like to thank you uh, and there are uh, operative videos available on our website um, 
on dfsurgery.com that show the Nissan fund application in patients that have not had any weight loss surgery procedures and even in patients that have had the sleeve or the duodenal switch and have presented with the reflux. Thank you. Have a good day.